Hi, I'm Mrs McTaggart and I'm going to take you through paper G, paper 2 of the practice papers from the National Five Maths website. Okay, question 1, we have to substitute into a formula using scientific notation. I've got a feeling I've seen this one already, actually. Um, so, basically, E equals M is replaced with 3.6 times 10 to the negative 2. And C is replaced with 3 times 10 to the power 8. And I have to square that. So... Option one is you can go straight to your calculator. Option two is you can write these numbers out in full. So just to do that, that would be 0 0.036, moving the point two places left, because it's a tiny number, times three with eight zeros, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then square it. I could potentially write 16 zeros there, but that's going to take up an awful lot of space because eight times two is 16. So you could go type that into your calculator. Or you could go back to the original line. To type it in, you'll be using the button that says times 10 with a wee blank power next to it. Or it might have a wee X there. Or one that says EXP, depending on how old your calculator is. That does the whole times 10 to the power bit. So for the first sum, technically you have to do 3.6, that button, minus 2, times 3, that button, 8, and then square it. So if I type that in, it gives me... Uh, two seconds. It gives me the answer of 3.24 times 10 to the power of 15 already in scientific notation for me. Thank you very much to my calculator. So remember that second line is only optional if you don't know how to use the, standard, the scientific notation button. Question two wants us to expand and simplify fully. So I'm going to write that first of all as x bracket x minus 1 x minus 1 again, so I'm going to put that out as a pair of brackets. Squaring those two brackets gives me x squared. It will give me negative x, negative x, so negative 2x. And at the end, it will give me a plus 1, because minus 1 times 1 is plus 1. Then I'm going to times everything there by x, so that gives me x cubed, minus 2x squared, plus 1x, but I don't write the number 1. Okay, so that's that one. Question three, we have to find the length of the arc. So arc formula is your angle over 360 times pi. Now it's either pi d or pi r squared. How do you decide? If you can't remember, use whichever one you want and you'll still pick up two out of three marks. But the way I teach it is area, you always write cm squared at the end. So that's your area one. Pi d is your circumference one, which is what we're after. So it's times pi d. And you just have to commit these to memory. So you've got 65 over 360 times pi times... Now, our radius is 2.3, making our diameter 4.6. And then go type that into your calculator. And you will get, to two decimal places, you'll get 2.61 metres. And that's that one. Nice, straightforward, if you remember the formula. Question four is I change the subject to R. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch that around so that my unknown is on the left-hand side because most people kind of like that. Remember, your aim here is to get R on its own. So we're going to deal with everything else around it. First thing we deal with is what I call the loose term, which is the Q. Q is positive this side, so that becomes negative on the other side. So we've got P take away Q. Then... You have to deal with the times by 2. Opposite times by 2 is divide by 2. So you've got P take away Q all divided by 2. And the last thing, the opposite of square rooting, sorry, the opposite of squaring is square rooting. I'm ahead of myself. And that gives you that. Notice how my square root covers the full fraction. What we don't want to see is this, where it looks like the square root is just on the top of the fraction. That is wrong. So nice big square root covering the full thing. Thank you. That's that one. Number five, we're solving this correct to two sig figs. So the mention of sig fig or um, decimal places means it is the quadratic formula. Please copy this down correctly. It is on the formula sheet. There is no excuse for copying it down wrongly. So there is your formula. Before I go any further, I'm going to write down A equals the first number, B equals the second number, and C equals the end number. And I always work out 4AC first, it just makes the substitution a bit nicer which is 4 times 2 times minus 7, which is minus 56. So when we sub in here, we have x equals minus b is the opposite of whatever you've written, so that's minus 3, 
plus or minus the square root of b squared is 3 squared, which is 9. Take away 4ac is negative 56 all over 2 times a, so 2 times 2 is 4. Now, the reason I do the 4ac is it just makes that bit a wee bit nicer under the square root, the discriminant part. You see the minus minus nice and clearly turning into a plus. If you hadn't done that, you would be trying to then square root a negative and it would come up error and you can't proceed with that. So 9 plus 56 gives us 65 all over 4. You then split this into two sums. So you've got x equals minus 3 add to your square root and x equals minus 3 minus your square root. Now, if you have the calculator that has the fraction button on this mode when it comes up the two squares, just type in exactly as it appears, and then it's dead easy to go back and edit and change it from a plus to a minus. If you're not using that style calculator, then you have to make sure you press equals after the top line. You do not work out what the square root of 65 is and round it. You do it all in one go, minus 3 plus root 65, hit equals, and then divide it before. Otherwise, your calculator will do the divide before, before it adds the square root. So that gives you your answers of... So the first one gives you 1.2655 and the second one will give you, so I'm just going back to edit that on my calculator and take out the minus, to plus and change it to minus. The second one gives you negative 2.765. Now the question wanted two sig fig, that's why I'm writing that down first of all. So two sig fig for the first one would give you 1.3. And the second one would give you negative 2.8. Um, so 1.3 and negative 2.8 for your two answers. Question six, we have a group of numbers. We want to calculate the median and interquartile range. So I'm going to go write these in order. So that's the numbers in order and I've got 12 and I've checked all 12 match up with the ones above. So 12 numbers split into half gives you six and six. So there's my middle. So that's my Q2. Split that again, there's my Q1. Split that again in the middle, that gives me my Q3. So at the side, I'm going to write down Q1 equals... Now, halfway between 43 and 47 is 45. Between 58 and 59... Sorry, uh, between 58 and 59 is 58.5. And my Q3 is, between those two, is 67. Interquartile range is quite often semi-interquartile range. So interquartile range is just the same but without half in it. So it's just Q3 minus Q1, which is 67, take away 45, which is 22. So my interquartile range is 22. So that's what the students got in their October test. We're then going to compare this. The teacher arranges extra homework classes and for the November test. In this test, the median is 67. So we can see straight away that the, 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 the median's improved. So that means the results are generally a bit higher um, and your interquartile range is lower. So a bit like standard deviation, the lower it is, the closer to the end numbers are. So we need to put that into a sentence. So using the median, the median has improved. It's gone from 58 to 67. So um, the marks are higher on average in December. So the marks are higher, excuse my writing, um, in December. Because average is another word for median. Median, mode, mean and range are all types of averages. So the marks are higher on average in December. And because your, lower, your interquartile range is lower, they are closer together. So they are less varied. And that would be your two statements that you need to make. Okay, so very similar to your standard deviation statements. Okay, question seven, we have got two yachts leaving on two different bearings. We have to find out how far apart they are. So let's put that in the triangle. This is what we are after. Now I'm going to put my north line here rather than where they've got it. So sailor number one, A, sailor A goes in a bearing of 72. So this angle here is 72. Sailor B goes on a bearing of 140. So see this angle in here that I'm just colouring in? That is 140. But I want this bit in here. So I need to do 140 take away 72, which is 68. So that's the angle I'm using, the 68, not the 140. That helps me get the 68. So I now know two sides and the angle in between. So that is good old cosine rule. So the one that goes like this, a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. 
and we are using the 30 and the 50. It really doesn't matter which way round they go. So we've got 30 squared plus 50 squared minus 2 times 30 times 50 times cos 68. Take that all in in one go. You get a really big number, 2276.18, so on. Remember, that's not the final answer because you've still got to square root the, that number. So we've got the square root of that number. And that gives you, and they've not mentioned any rounding, so I'm going to do two decimal places. It gives you 47.71 kilometres to two decimal places. Okay, quite like those ones. Question three, um, similarity question. The minute you see mathematically similar, that's what it is. And we're talking about area, so it's similar area. So we are told that panel A has a diagonal of 90 and the area of this one is 402. So I'm going to put that next to the picture. The other one has a diagonal 125. The salesman thinks that um, the panel B is just double the panel of A. So we need to see if he's right. So if he is, dub if it is doubled... We are aiming for an area of 8040. So if it's not 8040, he's wrong, right? So we need to somewhere say that that was a number that he thinks it is. Right, so we're going to pretend. Let's go get the area of the larger triangle. So the way to get the big one, so I do it all in one go. I say that the big area equals your scale factor squared times the wee area. Okay, some people say new and old instead. So that gives us, your scale factor is 125 over 90. We square it purely because it's an area one. If it's volume, you cube it. Um, and the wee area was 4020. And it is a calculated paper, so you can just go type that in. There's no need to simplify the 125 divided by 90, right? It really doesn't matter. We square it and we times it by 4020, and it gives us an answer of 7754.63. So that is the area of the big one. So, Mr. Salesman is wrong. So, is his claim justified? We have to say no, since. And then you compare the two numbers. 54.63, oh, I missed off my three, is less than his thingy, like that. So, we've done the numerical comparison, so it's not doubled. Okay? So numerical comparison, make sure you say yes or no because the question was really asking, is it justified or not? Question nine, what's a magnitude of a vector? So first thing I'm going to do is work out 2u minus v. So I'm going to double this one and then take away that one. So doubling the first one gives me 4, 0, 2. Take away 1, 2, minus 4. 4 take away 1 is 3, 0 take away 2 is minus 2. Just watch your signs. 2 minus minus 4 becomes 2 add 4, which is 6. The magnitude is then when you take each of those numbers and you square them under a the square root sign. Oops, a daisy. So you square them and add them all up. And you can do that all on your calculator. If you're going straight to the calculator, maybe you don't need to put that negative in because minus 2 squared is going to turn into 4. Anyway, so that gives us 9 plus 4 plus 36. So that gives you the square root of 49, which is 7. Okay, that technically could have been in a paper one with those numbers. Question 10, is this a right angle triangle? So this is A, this is B, this is C. I do this separately in a table. So I do A squared plus B squared, and I do C squared. Sometimes I do it the other way around, actually. So I work out what 90 squared plus 60 squared is. And I work out what 110 squared is. So 90 squared plus 60 squared is 11700. 110 squared is 12100. Now they don't match. Pythagoras said that if it was right angled, those two numbers should match. So then you write, since 90 squared plus 60 squared does not equal 110 squared, it is not right angled. And then the keywords is by the converse of Pythagoras. Okay, you do not go use Pythagoras to work out 
what C should be. And then if you do that, you work out that it's actually um, 108.2. And then you say, well, 108 isn't 110. They're looking for this kind of layout, this kind of format. Okay. Okay, question 10, we have a pyramid. It's quite a, a badly drawn pyramid. Um, some people might struggle to see that. It looks a bit more like a wonky rhombus. So it tells us though that the base of this is an equilateral triangle of side six and the height is seven. We have to find the volume of a pyramid, right? Volume of a pyramid is V equals one third AH, okay? Now, so we need to get the area of the triangle and we know the height. So we know it is one third times something times seven. Now, if you've got an equilateral triangle, that's six, six, and six. You need the area. There's two ways to go here. You can, sp you can split it down the middle and say, all right, this is three, this is six. Use Pythagoras to get the height, and then use half base times height. Or you can just know that the fact it's equilateral, so your angle is 60, and then use half A, B, sine C. So the area is a half times six times six times sine 60 which gives us um, an answer of 15.588. So our area is a third times 15.588. I'm actually going to use the full thing that's in my calculator um, and type that all in. And I get an answer of 36.37. And it's cubic centimetres. Okay, so it's breaking that one down. How do you get the volume of a pyramid? You need to memorise that as well. Because I don't think that one's on the formula sheet. Recognising your facts about an equilateral triangle. And then plugging in what you can. Okay, we've got a quadratic one. We're told the turning point, And we have to state the values of A and B. So I'm going to pretend we're asked for the equation. So if you're putting this in as equation, it's going 5 into the positive direction. So that would make minus 5 in the bracket all squared and then it's moved up one so plus one on the end now if i compare these two things together you'll notice my sign in the bracket has changed so the temptation would be to say that a is five but because the sign is different that makes a a minus five and your b is just one it then tells you pq is parallel to the x-axis we have to find the coordinates of p and q so p is the point where it cuts the y-axis now anything on the y-axis has the coordinate of zero something, right? It's along zero up something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put zero into this equation I've worked out up here. So I've got zero minus five all squared plus one. Zero minus five is just minus five. Squared is 25 plus one, which is 26. So P is zero, 26. Now we then get Q by using symmetry. So this is zero, this is five, so you add on another 5, so this is 10. So the coordinate of Q is along 10, up 26. Question 13 is a sine graph that has been moved down. So they've given you the equation. They want the coordinate of P. Now, the coordinate of P would have been, if that was just a 4 sine x graph, your normal sine graph looks like this. And because it is a 4 sine x graph, that would be 4 and minus 4. And your maximum turn occurs at 90. So P is still along 90, but it is not up 4 anymore. It which should have been up 4, but we've moved the graph down 3. So 4 minus 3 is 1. So that is the coordinate of P. It then wants you to get the coordinates of Q and R. So the coordinates of Q and R or when y equals 0. So we replace y equals 0 into our equation. So I'm going to find a wee bit more space. So you had the equation, y equals 4 sine x minus 3. But we knew that y was 0 because you're looking for basically where it sits on the x-axis. We need to rearrange this so that you have um, sine x on its own. So we have minus 3 becomes positive 3. So 3 equals 4 sine x. Uh, then 3 divided by 4 equals sine x. It's just a wee bit back to front. It's one of these, all sine tan cos tables. The fraction is positive, so we are using all and sine. So you go to your calculator, you do shift sine of 3 quarters. And to need a whole number, that gives us 49. So the acute angle is 49. So in the all box, you just take your calculated answer, x is 49. In the sign box, you do 180, take away 49, 
which gives you 131. Now, it wanted them as coordinates. So Q, I'm assuming Q was the first one. So Q was the smaller one. So that makes the coordinate of Q 49, 0. And it makes R 131, 0. Okay. That's just a slightly different way of um, presenting you with your TIG equation question. Question 14 is a quadratic. It's talking about something being shot up in the air. So flares fired from a cliff and T is your time. It says find algebra the time taken for the flare to enter the sea. So we are looking for this here. We are looking for that number there. We're looking for what T is. Now, as a coordinate, do you agree that that would be along something? In fact, let's do it as a question mark. That would be along something up zero, yeah? So your X value is what we're after. The Y is zero. Now, in this case, our Y is actually H for height. So we are going to replace H with zero. So you've got 48 plus 8T minus T squared, and that all equals zero. Right, this is normally factorise, get two brackets, break up the two brackets. I don't like the layout because it's a negative t squared. So I'm going to move everything over to my left hand side and change the signs. So that gives me t squared minus 8t minus 48 equals zero. Now I can factorise that. So I'm looking for numbers that multiply to 48 and add to 8. So numbers that multiply to 48 could be 4 and 12. That'll work. So 4 and 12. To get negative 8, that had to be positive 4 take away 12. You then put that equal to 0. And you put that equal to 0. So that gives you t is minus 4. And that gives you t is 12. Now, see that minus 4? That's actually what this one would be graphically here. Your time can't be negative. So we say not possible for that one. Some people write discard or not possible. So t equals 12. So the time taken is 12 seconds. They can also ask sometimes in that one, like where would the what would the maximum height of the flare? And to do that, you would work out what the middle of minus four and twelve is, which would be four, and you would then sub that into the equation. That would give you the maximum height of the flare, but it's not asking for that one in this one. So thanks very much.